All right, so in this episode, I'm going to talk about street smart versus book smart and how that applies in buying a house and why it's dangerous if you don't know the street smarts. <laughs> In this episode of Jeff Koga Live, I want to talk about uh, street smart versus book smart when it comes to buying a house. Now, why did I decide to talk about this? Um, well, yesterday I uh, did a podcast uh, interview, um, which will be released in three weeks or so, and I haven't done one of these episodes in a long time uh, being interviewed since uh, Jason Edwards uh, interviewed me on the Jason Edwards TV and I talked about going after your passion and talked about doing what you love and in the conversation in the podcast episode we started to talk about experience in the space of real estate and uh, a lot of my listeners here I know it's mixed but looking at the demographics I know that they're typically in the younger crowd uh, meaning that they're under 30 and those individuals typically reach out to me the most in terms of questions on the interweb space or right the internet space and uh, I get asked this question when it comes to like investing in real estate or buying a house so I figured that I make this episode to kind of clarify the difference between street smarts and book smarts right and uh, here's the issue that I have uh, as information has become commoditized and uh, I always say the biggest number one challenge we have as a society is to unlearn the things that we've learned and I think that's where the most difficult challenge that, that in the war that that's going to be uh, faced because things are changing so quickly and the fact that you can literally do hashtag GTSN what is hashtag GTSN Google that now right so so a lot of the younger generations when they uh, especially the millennial generation if you run into an issue guess what you do you Google it right now doing that is a textbook you know a book smart thing to do all right absolutely nothing wrong with that now why is that is because you'll get the answer that you need all right especially the generic common answer but the generic answer to solve a problem and or to give you a different type of solution doesn't typically come from simple searches on Google. I'll tell you that, all right? It has, it's going to come more from looking either in deep into Google, all right, or asking different questions to Google, which is very, very challenging if you don't know what questions to ask, right? The old cliche saying of, what you don't know, you don't know, Jeff, and it is so true. So how do you combat that? Well, I'm, a believer and this is because of my strength is that I am not a great researcher I'm a good enough uh, researcher where I can get in trouble <laughs> as I like to call so I like to just literally pick up the phone and call experts right experts as in people who have been there done that um, and uh, when you do that you get a different type of an opinion now there is a caveat there's kind of like an asterisk to this when you do this is to make sure that that expert does not have a professional bias uh, towards the outcome of your decision of whatever you're looking to do so if it comes to like buying a house right it's very very challenging because a lot of times people will turn to your local real estate estate agent okay and or friend that's in the real estate business that is a licensed commission individual and when that happens two things happens okay first one is that individual is a professional licensed individual now if that's the case guess what there is a professional bias I don't care what anyone else says when your livelihood is on the line there is a professional bias on being able to tell you which way the market is gonna go or which way or how you should actually buy and things like that versus the second type of individuals if they are licensed is that they're part-time meaning they have a license for the sake of having a license but they're not expert so imagine like for a second that you're trying to buy a house and uh, uh, you find a house that you like um, but you can't seem to get your offer accepted because the market is super hot then when that happens then what do you do 
Well, it's going to depend on the expert, right? Or the perceived expert um, in that case. If they are a true professional and they can get uh, deals, they will be able to find you deals, right? Some of the stuff that I teach is called like pending hijacking, where you go after properties that are pending, uh, meaning it's in contract and you're waiting for people to back out of deals. And when they back out of deals, that's how you get a discount. And uh, not only do you get a discount, but you go in and you start pre-negotiating a price ahead of times. So you don't go back and forth to try to figure out what the offer is, right? And a lot of times in the professional uh, professional space of uh, like real estate, which is really, really interesting to me because in certain parts of the country, there's something called fiduciary responsibility clause typically in the business profession code where you have to look out for the best interest of your client, all right? Now, in the space of real estate, it's really quite interesting because that fiduciary responsibility is literally a thin line. And here's a story I'll tell you. Imagine for a second here, okay? Let's just say someone does something wrong to you, all right? And you know it's clearly wrong. Now, what do you do? You got liquidated damages, someone hurt you financially, right? Emotionally, possibly. So, uh, and it's really bad to a point where you're just like, you know what? I gotta sue the person. So what do you do? You hire an attorney. And hopefully you hire an attorney that specializes in you know, some type of liquidated damages that you got hit with, and you hire an expert that can represent you, all right? Now, this expert that's representing you is going to put together a case to prove without a reasonable doubt that, hey, I was wrong. And because I was wrong, I have the right to X amount of dollar in claims, right? Now, the other side, the person that you sue, right it's called the, the defendant the defendant will hire an attorney to represent them as they say only a fool will represent themselves in uh, court and this particular attorney hopefully is an expert on that topic of what they're getting sued for and they can actually combat and dodge and fight and spin the truth to be able to win the case right that's the ultimate goal all right now let me ask you this, would you be okay if your attorney represented the defendant? And do you think that there's something wrong with that if that happens? So the attorney that you hire to protect you, look out for your interest, is now sitting on the other side of the courtroom as well. So he says, the judge says, hey, prove, state your case. And then your attorney stands up and states your case on why you got you know wrong, okay? And then the judge looks over to the defendant and uh, the attorney's not there. Why? It's because your attorney represents them. So the, <laughs> your attorney stands up, goes to the other side where the defendant is supposed to be, and it says, please, prove your case. And then he tells a different story. Clearly, as you can tell, that I'm telling this weird scenario of an attorney case that will not happen in typical uh, courtrooms, okay? You know that that is wrong. Okay, yet in the space of real estate, it happens all day long. It's called what? Dual agency. It's when a real estate agent represents both sides of a transaction. And please know that if you're listening to this in like California or certain states in uh, around the country, that actually certain states, it is actually illegal to represent, um, represent both sides of the party because they have actually said, hey, you can't have you can't represent both sides. How can you, right? When you know the seller's bottom line on one side and then you know what the buyer's willing to offer on the other side, then how can you fairly nego you know, how can you negotiate this uh, uh, fairly? And especially when you're incentivized as being paid a commission in between this transaction so you can get paid. You just can't. I don't care how good you are, you just simply cannot. It's really impossible, all right? And then here is... Another twist to this, if for anyone that's interested in buying a house or interested in learning about real estate, is that a salesperson in the space of real estate, that individual sales agent, not a broker, okay, a sales agent who gets a listing, okay, and or represents a buyer and have a buyer's agreement saying, hey, I will represent this buyer's exclusively, all right? And if they have this agreement, that agreement and contract that you have in place is actually owned by the broker of record, all right? The office. So think of it in terms of the sales agents are down here and at the bottom. And then at the top, you have the broker, the top broker who owns the company and or the licensed individual. It belongs to that person. So now, what if the listing is represented by one agent in the office, yet the buyer agent is represented by some other agent in the office as well? 
Now, if that happens, is that fair dueling? Is that fair negotiation? Can you still represent the client? And the truth is, if you use common sense and going back to the courtroom situation, right, you can kind of co find out where this is a gray area and it's really difficult to do, right? So again, going back to the courtroom, imagine your attorney represents you as the plaintiff and going after the other side, and then you're in the courtroom and you find out the attorney on the other side works at the same law firm defending the other person. Would you be comfortable with that? And probably your answer is no. And that's why it's really, really dangerous. And you got to know this because again, these are street smart stuff in the books. You know, you're not going to be able to learn about this, nor do they talk about this, right? Where if they're in the same office and they're talking back and forth and uh, your agent should be able to negotiate the best price. They should be able to pin the, the buyer down so they don't back out. And if you're a buyer on the other side, they should be working towards that one. Your deposit doesn't get at risk, okay, as well as you have favorable terms and you have contingencies in plan. So if magically something pops up, ooh, you can do something as well as be able to ask for discounts, be able to get, you know, if there's something you do your inspection and you find out that there's something wrong with it, you can get credit towards that, right? Or things like that, right? It's all part of negotiation. But the issue is, and I have a big issue of it, um, is when you're represented by both sides, you just can't simply do that. So in the space of uh, investment world, right, in my case, I've always told my agents that I work with to use something called a single party compensation agreement. And the single party compensation agreement is uh, geared towards representing me as the buyer uh, only. So that way there is no legal or and or fiduciary responsibility towards the seller. So the seller can never come back to the agent and be like, hey, by the way, you know what? I could have got more money, but the fact that I had to sell it, um, you know, I I got liquidated damages, right? And those are things that you want to be really, really careful about. And if you start paying attention to what's going on, right, you'll start seeing it. And especially if you're on the fence to buy a house, just know that that exists and just know that this is going on left and right. So make sure that you get an expert that's a badass negotiator, especially if this is the first time you're buying a house, uh, to be able to, one, you feel comfortable, but you know that person is a pit bull and is willing to go up the bat and negotiate uh, for you, all right? And really, I tell individuals that if you're buying a house for the first time, you should be uh, unreasonable in my opinion I know it sounds weird especially like a guy in the space of you know lead generation and you know people teaching you know people in the real estate space to do that if you're gonna buy a house be unreasonable especially because you have never done it right is to so uh, make demands that you you know things like that and then and then do your homework a lot of it okay and get advice from someone outside of the fact that doesn't have a professional bias and you'll be able to get an opinion and here's a prime uh, example a couple of years ago I I, uh, I helped a friend of mine buy a house so here's what happened all right originally they went to buy a house, made an offer on it, put a deposit in, and they had a 60-day escrow to close, so which is a long, long escrow. And during their inspection period, uh, they did termites, right, and property inspection, which is a typical process. Now, when they did the termite, it came back, and there was nothing wrong with it. All right, but he said that he went out there with his dad, and when they looked at these, they noticed some termite damages. And he said, so Jeff, what would you do? That's what he asked me. And then I said, well, before I tell you what you should do, I said, I asked the question, tell me the who's involved in the parties of the transaction. Then he said, X, Y, and Z. And I said, okay, great. Now, who's the listing agent? And he was just like, well, it's the same person. I was like, is that right? And I said, don't you think there's something wrong with that? And I gave him the same example of attorney who says like, well, I didn't think of it that way. He just told me that I can save uh, money because he's representing both sides. So he's cutting his commission down from uh, 5% to 4%. And that way he can give at least a half a percent to you, uh, to him, and a half a percent to the actual uh, seller. And I said, oh, okay, that makes sense, right? And he's like, uh-huh. And I said, okay, so who actually picked the termite company? Did you pick the termite company? That's what I asked him. He said, no, the attorney referred me someone. Okay, and I said, yeah, and I think that's an issue because if the termite company is referred, you know, you can kind of nudge the termite company to be like, hey, be a little bit uh, lenient on the inspection and they won't actually, you know, pinpoint some stuff, dry rot here and there or something like that. Okay, now why would they do that? 
One is because maybe this person is sending them tremendous amount of business, so they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them, so that's what they're doing that, okay? And or they may not point it out because if it points out, it slows down the, the closing process, right? Versus you, if for any inspection, I always tell individuals, if you're doing any inspection on a purchase, right, is to get someone that's not referred from a professional bias. Yes, it's okay to get referrals and stuff like that, right, and things like that, and it helps, but I, say, I highly recommend and challenge individuals to get inspectors from outside of them. And one, if you visually see something wrong and the inspection comes back, it looks like there's termite damages with the dad but then the reporter doesn't say guess what i told him i said go get another one and he says well i don't want to pay another money i said really he says the termite damages i don't know how big it is but you know it can be easily a thousand dollars two thousand dollars three thousand you rather pay that out of your pocket later on or would you rather pay 100 200 bucks now and to be able to figure out if this is something that you can negotiate and get it taken care of right now and so he ended up doing that and resubmitted it then guess what the seller did the seller said no 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 how can you say that there's damage? The first one said that there isn't any damage on this. So we can't do that. So so they call me up because the agent was just like, uh, why don't you just meet in the middle to actually just you know cut the cost? And then he hits me up and says, well, it sounds reasonable. Should I do that? And I was just like, dude, don't do that. Again, fiduciary responsibility. He's trying to close the deal and you can't knock him for his hustle. And I said, look, counter back and tell them to split the cost of a third inspection. Because I said, visually, you can see it. So why do you want to cut the cost? You see it. So the first one's clearly wrong. And then say, hey, you get to pick who it is. Right? And guess what they did? That's what happened. He negotiated that in. Finally, got a third one. And guess what the third one said? Boom, there are termite damages as well. And then I told him to take the highest bid that they're getting to fix it to negotiate that into and get credit towards that and or have them fix it. And guess what happened? They countered back and says, well, no, 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 that's overpriced. We'd rather just do it ourselves. And I told him, I said, look, you can do that. Just know that they're trying to save costs. So if you're going to do it, I highly recommend for you to at least take credit and then have someone else do it for you. And he's like, well, that's a headache to do. And I said, well, if that's a headache, what I would want you to do is that I'll have them pay them directly and or find someone else to do it. Now, clearly, they didn't want to do it. So what ended up happening is he just basically got the credit towards the proceeds from the proceeds and he got the money. It was about like, what, 3,200 bucks. And he ended up hiring someone else to actually do it, which was his uh, dad's uh, friend. But he was not a real uh, general contractor, but hired him and he paid him like 500 bucks to, uh, you know, fix the little siding of the, of the dry rot that, that was there. Right, which is really easy to do if you know what the heck that you're doing, right? So, um, again, these little stuff, yeah, you know, it's only like 2,500 bucks and stuff like that, but this is at a smaller scale and things that you have to pay attention to, especially if you're like buying a house for a first time. You got to look at things like when you do inspection, right? Are they inspecting the plumbing even all the way to the main line? Right. These are things that you have to be aware of. And so that's what I want to share with you, especially in the Internet land world, because I get asked from the younger generation. Hey, what are some of the things that um, you should look out for if you're looking to buy a house? And so I decided to create this video and talk about the difference between uh, book smart and street smart when it comes to buying a house and things that you can't actually read up about on the Internet land because it's kind of taboo to talk about. Right. So that's what I got. Hope you enjoyed it. This is Jeff Koch. I'm signing off, and I'll see you guys on another episode.